Ah, the Linux world, the only community where people have an opinion on any and every system component, including the init system that starts stuff on your computer. On many distros, system D is that init system, but this thing hasn't been widely accepted or liked by everyone. And you might be wondering why. After all, if you've encountered any form of comment on any social platform, you might have seen someone criticizing systemd for one reason or another. So today we'll look at what systemd is, how it works, why it's getting so much criticism online, and at why it's taken so long for me to reach this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Squarespace and if you need a website but you don't know how to get started or you don't have any technical knowledge, then Squarespace will be your go-to platform. They have pre-made templates for every kind of website and you can completely customize these by just adding or removing blocks and reordering them on the page graphically. You can change the fonts, the colors, the visuals, everything. And when you want to start adding features to your website, Squarespace has a collection of modules that are just as easy to use. You can get a complete shop with online payments, a members-only area, a video gallery, and more. And to make sure people can actually access your website, Squarespace can also help you book your domain name. So head over to squarespace.com slash the Linux experiment or just click the link in the description below and you'll get 10% off your first purchase. So first, what is systemd exactly and what is an init system? All Linux-based systems use an init system, short for initialization. It's the first process that starts after you boot your OS and it runs in the background while you're using your computer to manage system services and various processes. It's basically what lets your system function by starting what's needed in the order you need it and launching the cascade of systems you need to actually get a login manager, a desktop environment, access to the internet, and more. And for many, many Linux distributions, systemd is that in its system. Systemd is a relatively recent project, at the scale of Linux anyway. It started in 2010 and it was spearheaded by Red Hat, with the prolific Leonard Puttering at the helm. Its goal was to replace the existing solutions like SysV or Upstart, to add more parallel processing, to speed up boot times, and to reduce the amount of resources the shell uses in the background. It quickly became the default on Fedora, obviously, then on Arch Linux, Debian, Ubuntu, SUSE, and many, many others. Adoption was helped by the fact that other init systems we're getting pretty old, hard to maintain, and distros just did not want to expend any time patching them to keep them alive. And so systemd basically conquered the Linux world as far as init systems go. A few distributions still don't use it, like Alpine Linux, MX Linux, Void Linux, Artix, and a few others. But why is that? Why is systemd not used by everything like the Linux kernel is? The famous bloat argument is the one advanced most often. Systemd, as time went on, encompassed more and more features that were generally handled by individual services before, not the init system itself, like device management, login, or network management, creating logs and stuff like that. This can be perceived as going against the Unix philosophy, where a piece of software is supposed to do just one thing and to communicate well with other small systems. And this is definitely somewhat true. Systemd has grown to do stuff that were generally not the purview of an init system. It does more than just starting the various system services that you need. But also it is very modular. Systemd is more of an umbrella project that has plenty of mini binaries that do different things instead of being just one giant monolithic executable. In that regard, it still kind of follows the Unix philosophy. Basically, how bloated it is depends on how the distro you use implements it. What is certain is that most distros that implement it are general purpose distros that need to provide as many systems as possible. And so they tend to use most of systemd's features and modules, which results in systemd looking to be always a big monolithic thing. 
System D is also a well-maintained project, so it gets updates regularly and it gains new features, which means it gets bigger and will use a bit more space and resources than other init systems. Some people want to rip out every single thing they don't use and they want a system that's one kilobyte leaner if they can. And with System D, it's harder to do so. System D also hides away certain configurations behind its own tools, like System CTL instead of exposing everything as a config file. In practice, it doesn't change a thing, you can still change the settings and tweak things, but some people really like having text files they can edit manually, and systemd doesn't let them do that as much. So it's hard to argue that systemd isn't getting bigger and bigger than previous init systems, and it's also hard to argue that systemd is moving away a bit from the Unix philosophy, but whether that's important to you as the user depends on how customizable you want your device to be. Another criticism leveled at System D is the fact that it has become so pervasive that a lot of other components are created with a hard dependency on it. Without System D, they can't work at all or they will have a limited feature set. Stuff like logging in to a graphical session or managing a network connection often uses System D components out of simplicity more than anything else. It doesn't mean it can't be done without it, but since it's there, it's being used. And this results in a bit of extra work for distros that don't want to implement System D, as they have to find and provide and maintain solutions that replace these implementations. It's a case of most people use one thing, so people who don't want it have to put in some extra work. Of course, it's hard to blame applications, desktop environments, and other projects for using those systemd components because they're stable, they're here, most distros use them, they're reliable, and they're well-maintained. So why would you go out of your way to invent something else? If you give me a toaster that also butters my toast, I am not inventing a new machine that specifically butters the toast because I want modularity. I'm not that special. Another regular criticism of systemd comes from the fact it's mainly a Red Hat project, or at least it was started by Red Hat. No one had any issue with that when Red Hat was its own thing. But now it belongs to IBM, and we've seen a few changes in how the company handles its community, mainly with access to Rails source code. The fact that systemd is a Red Hat project leaves some people wondering if it doesn't give too much control to one single entity over how Linux systems are started and managed. Added to that is the fact that systemd was started as a project at around the same time as Ubuntu started Upstart, another init system that had the same goals and is now unmaintained. So obviously people jump to the conclusion that Red Hat was trying to sabotage Ubuntu's project instead of using Occam's razor and realizing that the Linux community always does this. We always create three different projects at around the same time that do the exact same thing and in the end only one or two survive. In this case, it was systemd because it was objectively better than upstart. The fact remains that while systemd was started at Red Hat, it is an open source project and it is receiving contributions from a lot of people that don't work at Red Hat. And for now, there haven't been any signs I could find that the people managing that project restrict things in a way that would only benefit Red Hat. But you never know, things might change and that's why you can do forks in the open source community, which would result in basically every single distro using a fork and not using systemd and leaving Red Hat completely isolated. So I don't see this happening anytime soon. Another criticism of systemd is that it's making Linux-based systems uniform and that it restricts choice. Since systemd is pretty much ubiquitous, it restricts the amount of interest there is in other projects and so you don't have the usual amount of choice you would find on Linux. And I would argue that compared to other arguments, this one doesn't really have any truth to it, because you do have alternative projects like OpenRC, SysV init, or D init, and they all provide a fully functional experience, and they all have their own advantages and disadvantages. Just because there is one major project used by a lot of people doesn't mean that other projects cannot exist, because they actually do. Still, with systemd growing in scope and its components being used more and more by major projects, I can understand the argument that it's harder to not use it nowadays, but it is still possible. 
And one could say the same thing about the COPS printing drivers, or the Linux kernel, or the Mesa drivers. There's really just one solution here, and it basically killed the other alternatives. And I don't see anyone complaining about that. One final problem people identify with systemd is system security. First, there's the fact that having one single system that powers the init and service management of most distros is a security risk. An attacker can target many, many systems by just targeting systemd. Second, some people would say that since systemd is huge and does a lot of things, it has a very large attack surface. Which, well, okay, I'm no security expert, but if systemd didn't do all of these things, another project would have to do them, so the attack surface would be the exact same. It is true, however, that having one unified system across distros makes it easier to attack all distros at the same time. But also, would you rather trust a big project with contributions from most major Linux players, or a cobbled together suite of scripts that do the same thing but is maintained by three people. Personally, I'll stick to the big one. I've got nothing against smaller projects, but for something as crucial as starting my system, I want something reliable and well-maintained. So, most of these issues aren't just complete nonsensical hate. They are rooted in reality and real-life concerns. Some are just overblown, but some aren't. So, there are reasons why you would not want to use systemd. But why would you want to use that thing specifically? Systemd might be a compilation of multiple systems and services, but it is a unified project, which means you don't have to learn 20 different programs and scripts if you need to interact with something. You can learn how systemd works, and you can then manage everything. In a way, while the project itself is complex, it makes managing your system less so. Compared to other init systems, systemd is also simpler because it opens various sockets that services can plug into, and services can start in mostly any order. Other systems tend to require precise configuration to start all services in the right order, which might result in broken systems if you're not sure how to handle things. Systemd is also well integrated in the Linux kernel, using C groups to organize processes and to better manage resources used to run these processes. And finally, systemd is written in C, and it isn't the usual compilation of bash scripts, so it tends to be faster and more efficient than many other init systems. And of course, if you tailored your own way of starting your system with your own scripts that you minutely edited each one by one, you might have a faster system than with systemd. But for the general purpose of a general purpose distro, then systemd is generally going to be way faster. In the end, systemd is just one component of a Linux-based system. Like every other component, it has its detractors and its users. It's the same kind of deal as with Wayland and X11. Each has advantages and drawbacks, and each has its own crowd of supporters, and dare I say, haters. For most users though, you should not care in the slightest. Just use what your distro provides. If it's systemd, and that's very likely, then you've got a competent, easy to learn, fast init system. If that's not systemd, then you've got an equivalent alternative that works really well and you're probably closely aligned to the Unix philosophy. Personally, I don't care at all. I use systemd and I know how it works, but it's mostly because the distros I actually want to run on my hardware all use systemd. If this changes and I start being interested in something else that doesn't use systemd, then I won't use systemd. I don't care, it's up to the distro to provide a coherent experience that actually works, is manageable, is reliable and stable. If that's with systemd, I know how to use it, it's no problem. If that's not with systemd but the experience is still good, I don't care either, my life isn't any harder. But our sponsor might make your life actually easier. If you're a Linux user and you plan to replace your computer soon, stop looking at devices that ship with Windows pre-installed and try to retrofit Linux on top of it just by something that supports Linux out of the box from our sponsor, Tuxedo. They have a big range of devices that ship with Linux pre-installed. All the components have been picked because they are compatible and work well with Linux. And if there were any kinks or quirks to iron out, they submit patches upstream to fix that for everyone. 
Their range is pretty big, they have devices from Ultrabooks, Nox, gaming laptops, towers, workstations, whatever you need. All the laptops are openable, repairable and upgradable and they have something for every need and every price point. You can even choose your own custom keyboard layout or have your own logo laser etched onto the lid of your laptop. So click the link in the description below if you need a new device, you want to run Linux on it and you want to support Linux's development. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications or to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, you know what to do. There's that thumbs down button and the comment section as well. And if you really enjoyed the video, well, there are plenty of links in the description of the video to do just that from Patreon, LiberaPay, YouTube memberships, PayPal, whatever, you know how this works. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.